Moving on to our next session of the day, I would now like to invite Professor Neena Modi and Dr. Jashree Morkar to deliver sessions on advanced nutrition. Uh, I'd like to reintroduce her. Uh, Dr. Neena Modi is a professor of neonatal medicine at Imperial College London and consultant in neonatal medicine at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital London. She is academic lead of multidisciplinary neonatal research group addressing early life, growth and nutrition determinants of long-term health. She also leads neonatal data analysis unit that integrates the use of clinical electronic data for research and health services support. She is currently the elected president of Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Dr. Jayashree Mohan, she is a professor and head of department of neonatology at Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College and Hospital Mumbai. She is also a director of Human Bank. Welcome. And my thanks um, to that of uh, um, uh, Samir's for how wonderful an occasion this has been to, uh, to, to be here and how well we've been looked after. Many, many thanks indeed. It's been a real pleasure. Um, what uh, Professor uh, Jayashree and I talked about yesterday was that we don't want to repeat everything that was discussed yesterday. So what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is just pick up on some things that we didn't particularly uh, discuss in relation to enteral nutrition when we had our discussion session yesterday. And then uh, in the course of this talk, I'm going to pick up on a couple of areas where there, I think there is good opportunity to actually fill in some of the gaps in our evidence base and do some collaborative um, work together. So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the developmental considerations that you need to take into account when feeding um, very preterm babies. Think about the goals that you are actually tackling. What is it you want to achieve when you have a nutritional strategy? Uh, when to start enteral feeds? What milk to use? How quickly should you advance them? Should you use fortification? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, how are you going to evaluate your practice? So let's just talk about some developmental considerations which make uh, for a unique situation with the newborn in comparison to any other age group. And the first thing I'd like you to remember is that the fetus in utero is already swallowing about 150 mils per kilo per day of amniotic fluid. So when you get worried about giving volumes of milk to your baby, think about what this baby was doing when the baby was in, in utero. And that amniotic fluid contains carbohydrates, proteins, electrolytes, immunoglobulins, all sorts of things. And these, this, this uh, nutrition, this enteral nutrition that goes on in utero is extremely important for the development of gastrointestinal function. So feeding a baby enterally does not begin after birth. It begins before birth when the baby is still in the womb. The other important thing to remember is that even if you provide nutrients parenterally, so even if you provide true total parenteral nutrition, the lack of enteral intake leads to some very adverse effects. So you have decreased circulating gut peptides, you have slower turnover of enterocytes, you have poor nutrient transport, decreased bile acid secretion, and as a consequence, increased susceptibility to infection because of the impaired barrier function of the intestine. So every time you starve a baby, every time you put a baby nil by mouth, you are compromising that baby's um, intestinal epithelium, you're increasing the risk of infection, and you're making it harder for the baby to tolerate enteral feeds when you start again. The third point I, I want to emphasize is that for fat digestion, the newborn baby depends in part on lingual lipase, which is stimulated by sucking and swallowing, and by nutrients in the stomach. So if you feed a baby nasogastrically and you stop the baby sucking and swallowing, you're actually diminishing the baby's ability to actually digest fat, which of course is a major source of energy. So the key point here is that sucking, swallowing, and food in the intestine, enteral substrate, promote intestinal growth and the establishment of the microbiome and digestion. And so providing parental nutrition is not the solution. <coughs> now what else do I mean by goal-directed care? Well, once again, why is the baby, uh, the preterm baby unique? Uh, this is because adipose tissue and hepatic glycogen stores are laid down primarily in the third trimester. So a baby who misses out on third trimester development and the severely growth-restricted baby will have very limited nutrient stores. And over on the bottom right-hand panel there, uh, uh, you will see the, the, the classic slide which demonstrates why 
we have to provide both um, amino acids or protein and glucose to a newborn preterm baby. If you look at the... Um, If you look at the, um, the right-hand panel, you'll see that this uh, on the, on the uh, y-axis here, you'll see whole body protein content, and on the x-axis is age in days. And if you give a baby um, glucose alone, which is the triangles, then the baby will lose over the course of the progressively over the course of the first week. The baby is going to lose a steady amount of whole body protein. And this is what I so say. This is what happens when you provide dextrose alone, glucose inf uh, infusion alone. But if you give one, at least one gram per kilo per day of amino acids, then you will maintain that baby in balance. They will not lose protein. But if you increase here to three grams of amino acids per day or thereabouts, then the baby will start to accumulate whole body protein at a rate which is starting to approximate to the intrauterine protein accretion rate. So this is the justification for providing at least around about three grams of amino acid per day intravenously. So the message here, the take home message is to provide sufficient energy and protein to maintain normal glycemia obviously, but also to pr prevent catabolic losses and from the second week to sustain a weight gain of around 14 to 16 grams per kilo per day. Now we've spoken about colostrum quite a lot yesterday, so I'm only going to reiterate to bear in mind that colostrum and milk is far more than nutrition. It is a therapy. It's a medicine in newborn care. Maternal colostrum and milk a composition is unique to each mother. It's a rich source of immunologically active molecules. It also contains prebiotic oligosaccharides, long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, trophic factors, bars, salt stimulated lipase, a host of hormones and also probiotic species. You can't get this off the shelf. So give colostrum as soon as possible, and we spoke a lot about that yesterday. But the other important thing uh, for us to realize, and I repeat, um, breast milk is not nutrition, it's a medicine, and that is the impact of breastfeeding on neurocognitive outcome. So this is a meta-analysis that was published in 1999, quite some years ago, but it shows what it is a meta-analysis of observational studies which have been um, uh, which have been adjusted for confounding factors. And you will see that the summary is that breastfeeding is associated with a cognitive benefit of about 6.2 uh, developmental points. There's the 95% confidence interval, a very, very um, strong evidence of benefit. And if, you, if any one of us would, would uh, be told, would we want to give our children something that would be associated with a 3.2 developmental point advantage, of course we would want to do it. And bear in mind that the benefit is also greater in low birth weight infants by about 5.2 DQ points. So that really is the overwhelming um, justification for using breast milk. But when I say breast milk is a medicine, Medicines have a dose-response relationship very often. So breast milk also has a dose-response relationship. And this is the most recent data that's been published. This comes from Paula Meyer's group. It was published last year. And, it sh and what you can see plotted here is what she calls the, um, the daily dose, the average daily dose of human milk, ADDHM, uh, between days 1 to 28 after birth. And you will see here that this on y-axis is the proportion of infants with survival free of sepsis. And the, uh, the proportion of babies that survive free of sepsis falls very rapidly for babies who get less than 25 mils per kilo per day of <coughs> maternal milk. But whereas if you look at babies who get more than 50 mils per kilo per day, that's their survival free of, of sepsis. So another nice illustration of the dose-response relationship on this occasion, not in relation to neurodevelopment, uh, neurocognitive outcome, but in relation to sepsis. And there was a, lot, a, large dis a long discussion about the, um, the damaging effects and the fear of sepsis yesterday. This is probably the most powerful and proven therapy to reduce the risk of sepsis. Now, a few words about a healthy microbiome and a healthy um, uh, mi microbial flora in the gastrointestinal tract. 
And this, I, this is the best illustration, the best um, pictorial illustration that I've seen. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001 from Madara and colleagues. And it's, it shows a series of experiments which demonstrates how commensal bacteria in the intestinal tract secrete toll-like receptor ligands, such as uh, lipopolysaccharide, which interact with the normal um, intestinal epithelium with a population of surface toll-like receptors to induce basal signaling. So to induce basal signaling, which enhances the ability of the intestinal, uh, sorry, the epithelial surface to withstand injury and also to enhance repairs. And if you block this, so in the series of experiments that they describe in this paper, if you block this either distally here or you block it by removing the bacteria that are responsible for initiating these, um, these actions, you, you, you can damage the uh, intestinal epithelium. And so the concluding line is that both enteral substrate and a healthy microbiome are protective to the gastrointestinal tract. And it comes back to our dis discussion yesterday about not only providing enteral substrate food into the bowel, but also promoting the development of a healthy microbiome as opposed to a microbiome which is formed from pathogenic hospital-acquired bacteria. So the, 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 the punchline about uh, promoting a healthy microbiome is vaginal delivery, avoid cesarean section. Cesarean section is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a harmful factor in neonatal units, promote skin-to-skin -skin contact and breastfeeding, and major negative impact of cesarean section, antibiotics, and exposure to hospital-derived organisms. So to move on then, when should enteral feeding start? The implications for practice here from the research that's been done to date are absolutely clear. Do not delay, start straight away, as soon as, as possible, within the first few hours of birth. Get some enteral substrate in there. Don't forget, I remind you, the baby before birth has been actively swallowing don't break that, uh, that, that positive and beneficial cycle. So all of the, um, uh, the, the, the meta-analysis point to absolutely the same conclusion, do not delay. The next question though, where there is a lot of uncertainty, and we touched on this yesterday, and we both decided that we would speak a little bit more about this, because we, we, I think we have a similar practice, but slightly, slightly different, different views, that this is hopefully gonna come out in the discussion. What milk should we use? Well, we have a choice of mum's milk, donor milk, preterm formula. Um, in many countries um, in Europe, not in the UK, but in many European, other European countries, I quickly said other European countries, we're still part of the European Union, um, they used hydrolyzed formula. Um, and then, of course, there's a choice of using full-term formula, which is really not appropriate for preterm babies. But if your back is against the wall, these are the choices that you have. So when it comes to using mum's milk, and very often our mothers and babies are separated, or the mothers are sick, or the babies are sick, it's about getting a mother to express and storing her milk. And the important practical points here are storage. So in a domestic fridge at four degrees centigrade, you can keep expressed breast milk for about four days. In a domestic freezer, that's a compartment um, freezer in a fridge, at minus 15 degrees centigrade, you can keep it for about two weeks. And in a standalone domestic freezer at minus 20 degrees for about six to 12 months. So in our hospital freezers, we will keep uh, mother's express breast milk um, frozen for 12, for 12 months. But what about human donor milk? So around the world, you'll see a proliferation of human donor milk banks. And the real question is, should we be using human donor milk in preference to formula? Now, we, would, we all hope that human milk, even if it comes from a donor, is going to be superior to formula. But let's just examine the evidence here, and let's look at the evidence in detail. So first of all, human donor milk is not equivalent to maternal milk. It may be, or it may not be, as efficacious, but it's not equivalent. And the reason it's not equivalent is because donor milk does require pasteurization if you want to be absolutely uh, secure that you're not going to be transmitting bacterial infection, viral infection, of which cytomegalovirus is the most likely, or um, HIV. 
Pasteurisation and the setting up of a human milk bank is expensive. In the UK, I don't know what, what it costs here, but in the UK it's estimated that each litre of human donor milk costs £200. So that is more expensive than the most expensive milk whisky. It is an extremely expensive product. <coughs> the composition of donor milk is very, 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 of all human milk is very variable indeed. And in many respects, you, I haven't got time to go into this literature, but in many respects, the composition of human milk is really unique to an individual mother. And one area which is particularly unique is in the, comp in the content of human milk oligosaccharides. Um, so the, these the human milk oligosaccharides are prebiotics. They promote the growth of beneficial bacteria. And the HMO, the human milk oligosaccharide content of breast milk, is uniquely tailored to an individual mother, and it reflects her genetic makeup. And it's probably uniquely um, uh, interrelated to the microbial flora that she carries. So composition is variable. Pasteurization either destroys or reduces many immunologically active components. And of course, there is a fear. We all know that if you provide formula to a mother, she is less likely to breastfeed. But if you provide human donor milk, there is also a concern that by providing another substance, she may be less likely to, to breastfeed. But there have not been good studies done to demonstrate whether or not that is truly the case. So there's controversy about whether providing donor milk reduces or enhances a mother's success at breastfeeding. Then, of course, donor milk, particularly from a mother who's delivered a full-term baby or who's been lactating for uh, several weeks, this milk is going to have a lower protein content than, than milk from a mother who's delivered preterm. And finally, as I say, we, we risk creating another industry. We're frightened of the formula milk industry, but now we risk creating a donor milk industry. So those are the, the, the theoretical issues around donor milk. But what evidence do we have? And here I think we have collectively, internationally, as a neonatal community, have to hang our heads in embarrassment because the evidence is really just not there. So in, um, if you look at the Cochrane reviews, so this is quickly, uh, uh, colleagues, this is the updated Cochrane Library Review published in 2014. If you look at all of the published evidence of human donor milk, when it's used in conjunction with um, uh, preterm formula, sorry, when it's compared with preterm formula, either a sole diet, so this is randomized trials where babies are randomized to receive either human donor milk or formula as sole diet, this is what you see. Just under 400 babies have been recruited to trials, and these trials were largely, the, the major contributor was our Lucas's trials, which were carried out in the early 1980s. That's 30 years ago. So we not only have a completely inadequate sample size, but we also have trials which were carried out 30 years ago. Um, and what, what, these, what the meta-analysis shows here is that yes, the relative risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, this is the, um, if, you, if you feed a baby exclusively formula as opposed to exclusively donor milk, there is a very, very high relative risk, almost five times the risk for necrotizing enterocolitis if you feed formula. But that is, on the basis of trials carried out in the 1980s, a very inadequate sample size, um, and a population of babies that is not as premature as the population that we deal with today. Also, we would never give a baby exclusive formula. We would be using maternal milk and top, topping up a shortfall with formula if it was insufficient. So let's look at the published evidence when you compare human donor milk against preterm formula when each is used as a supplement to maternal milk. And here we also have a wholly inadequate sample size, 500 babies in total in the meta-analyses, and we have a relative risk that does not reach significance. 1.96 with a confidence interval of 0.8 to 4.7, so an, a non-significant result. So the bottom line is we don't know. We really don't know. And this is why I say there is an urgent need for trials here. And this is one area where I think that collaborative um, research is absolutely eminently possible. And we could, uh, we, could, we could find the numbers very, very quickly between us. And I'm going to come back to that point. 
The other big piece of evidence, and the only piece of evidence, so this is uh, again the same systematic review from Quigley and colleagues, this is formula versus donor milk as a, as a supplement to mother's milk. This is what we do today. And this is in relation to systemic infection. There's been only one trial carried out, that was of uh, um, uh, Richard Chandler's in 2005, 10 years ago now, and this is what you see. Absolutely um, equivocal, the jury's out. We really don't know whether this uh, using donor milk instead of formula as a supplement to mother's milk is going to have an impact on sepsis. So there's a really urgent need for more evidence here. And so to summarize, I think this is where we are with donor milk. We hope it's going to be beneficial, but we really need evidence of efficacy, effectiveness, feasibility, cost benefit, safety, um, and the implication for practice is that we, we should really, I think, be putting our efforts absolutely wholeheartedly into providing maternal milk, and as a researcher, I would say, into addressing this evidence gap. Because if donor milk is useful, then each and every one of our babies should be eligible to receive it. Let's move on then to how quickly should we advance feeds. So there, I mentioned yesterday that there is a large trial, the SIF trial, in, uh, running in the UK, which many, many people would think is quite a rapid advancement volume. And I just want to show you what happens in this trial, which has not yet been published. So, um, <coughs> sorry, 200 infants weighing less than 1,000 grams, very low resource setting, very limited, um, uh, sorry, no parental nutrition, babies were fed human milk exclusively, um, and the babies were randomized to one of four groups, exclusively receiving human milk, either mother's milk or donor milk, no formula whatsoever. Low or high volume initiation, that's four mils or 24 mils per kilo per day on day one, and then increasing by a slow or fast 24 or 36 mils per kilo per day. The primary outcome measure was time to reach 1,500 grams, and the reason that outcome was chosen was because at 1,500 grams, these babies go to full 24-hour kangaroo mother care. As I say, this was a very low, um, low income setting. And um, so the rapid advancement group, this is, uh, and the high initiation group, that's the yellow line here, was the first, not surprisingly, was the first to reach 1,500 grams. Um, and the hazard ratio you see here in the confidence interval of 2.3, um, P not equals 0.003. These were fewer days in, and fewer days in hospital as well. But the, this was a pilot study. This is not powered to detect functional outcomes. And of course, what we're really worried about is the impact on necrotizing enterocolitis and mortality. But what was reassuring about this study is that there was no increase in necrotizing enterocolitis or death. It wasn't powered to detect necrotizing enterocolitis or death. But at least we have some safety data now which provides the reassurance that we can go ahead to a much larger multi-center, multinational trial. And that's where we would like to go with this next, because this very, very simple strategy, starting at 24 mils per kilo and going up quickly, could be hugely beneficial to babies around the world in both high, middle, and low income settings. And so this is another trial that I feel um, is a very, very good possibility for collaborative delivery. Then multi-component fortifier, should this be added to human milk? Um, opinions are very, very strong on this if you look at what happens around the world. If you talk to um, an American audience, they are absolutely committed to using fortifier. And they will use fortifier once the baby is on a relatively low volume of feed. So you're talking about 40, 50 mils per kilo or even less. If you, um, Look at this. we've surveyed what happens in the UK. We're very conservative about using Fortifier. Uh, the minority of clinicians will use will use Fortifier, and those who do use it will not start to use it until the baby is on 150 mils per kilo per day. And if you look at practice in Europe, it's somewhere between these two extremes. So internationally, as a community, we really do not know what the right thing to do is to uh, in relation to routine multi-component fortification of human milk for very preterm babies. There are very good theoretical grounds, and that is because preterm babies do need a higher protein content that might be provided with human milk, particularly if it's donor milk. Um, and also, preterm babies do require um, uh, multi-component additions, particularly minerals, sodium, 
phosphorus and calcium. So if you can't use fortifier or you don't, use, don't wish to use fortifier, then certainly preterm babies less than 32 weeks gestation do need fortification with mineral supplements with sodium, calcium and phosphorus in these sorts of, uh, these sorts of uh, um, uh, doses. What is the evidence in relation to uh, the, the benefits of fortification? Again, very, very limited indeed. So this is um, once again from the Cochrane Library. This is published 2004. You will see it here on the top panel, the impact on neurodevelopment. One of the chief issues that we're concerned about and that we hope to improve when we, put, when we fortify human milk, we really want to improve a better neurodevelopmental outcome. What studies have been done? Again, internationally, this is, um, this is not good. A single study, this is Alan Lucas, 1996, um, 250 babies, um, an equivocal result. We really don't know whether routine fortification improves neurodevelopment or not. Another prime example of research that is just crying out to be done. And here you will see the impact on necrotizing enterocolitis. The reason why UK um, neonatologists tend to be frightened of using fortification, whether they're right or wrong, nobody knows, but the reason they're frightened is because they're frightened of necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, once again, the jury's out. These are the studies that have been done um, in relation to NEC, but we really have an equivocal answer. We don't know whether fortification increases or does not increase the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. In the last few minutes, I want to move to away from randomized controlled trials into other methods of, of evaluating practice. And I'm showing you some data here which comes from... Um, from a, a, a unit that I run, the Neonatal Data Analysis Unit, um, where, we, where we pull data from um, all, every single neonatal unit in the country, all 200 neonatal units in the country. So this is a testament to the collaborative efforts of every single neonatologist and neonatal unit in the UK. And the data that um, are pulled are used for a number of different purposes. I'm just showing you one example here which is where we're benchmarking here. Again, these are the 23 neonatal networks in the UK. Each neonatal network comprises anything between eight to 10 neonatal units. And they're all listed here. So this is all completely transparent. This is not anonymized data. And you will see here breastfeeding of babies less than 30 weeks gestation, mother's milk at discharge, and this is time to first feed. So if, let's look at, uh, at the mother's milk at discharge. The blue bars are, are um, partial breastfeeding and the red bars are exclusive breastfeeding. You can see some networks not doing so well, others doing much better. By publishing these sorts of data, making them freely available in a very transparent way, we can monitor our progress year on year and we compare our progress with the best against the poorest performing to see whether or not collectively we can improve on what we're doing. And another example here is time to first feed. This is a box and whisker plot showing the median time to first feed by different gestational ages. This is complete population data. Every single baby admitted to a neonatal unit is included in this figure. So this is the true representation of what's going on today. And you'll see that at 23 weeks gestation, the median time to first feed is four days, but the, um, the range extends from two days to about 12 or 13 days. However, if you go down the other end to 28, 29, 30, 31 weeks, you'll see that many units are starting to feed on the first day, even though the median is still either around two or three days. And once again, by comparing these data year on year, we can look to see whether we are meeting the standards that we set ourselves. And I could show you other data looking um, uh, um, at, at other as aspects of care. I'll just show you one more though, which is time to formula. We're all trying to give breast mothers breast milk, but inevitably we end up having to use formula. And this shows here, this is the cumulative, this is the incidence. Once again, this is whole population data. Every single baby in the country has contributed to this. This is time in days here on the x-axis, the cumulative incidence of um, uh, receipt of formula. This is 23 weeks. And if you follow the line for 40 days, you'll see that at 40 days, only 20% of babies born at 23 weeks gestation are receiving formula. So we're trying very, very hard to give mother's milk. 
But at 40 days, the same, if you look at 31 weeks, over 60% of um, babies have received some formula. So you can see here how we are doing in relation to being successful at providing breast milk by different gestational ages. And we are really, really trying hard for the low gestation ages. And we're not, perhaps not trying so hard or perhaps just not doing so well for the more mature babies. Just a word about the adverse impact of the breast, uh, marketing of breast milk substitutes. Um, I'm not sure what the situation here is in India at the moment. It's a question that I want, want to ask of you. But certainly around the world, there is, uh, there is still um, evidence of the adverse impact of marketing of, of breast milk substitutes, in other words, formula. And there is still variable adherence to the WHO International Code on marketing of breast milk substitutes, which was passed in 1981, I remind you this, those younger members of the audience, I'll give you a bit of neonatal history, and that is that this WHO code was passed in 1981 by 118 votes to one. The sole negative vote was unfortunately cast by the United States. That is a bit of neonatal history. Um, and this code arose out of concern that the increased mortality of babies in the developing world was really associated with the aggressive marketing of formula feeds. And the code prohibits advertising of baby formula and giving free samples, bottles, teats, or gifts to mothers or health workers. And that code remains an important aspect of newborn care to this day. So just to summarize then, enteral feeding of very preterm babies, immediate introduction of maternal colostrum, parental nutrition for as short a time as possible, maternal milk as soon as available, Increase in steady increments of between 15 to 30 mils per kilo per day. Maybe we can increase more until at least your top, the baby is being given 200 mils per kilo per day. And as we said yesterday, many people will go up even higher. Transition to suck feeds at the breast as soon as possible. There's no evidence yet of advantage of donor breast milk over formula when used to supplement maternal milk. But there, and there's good theoretical grounds, but no conclusive evidence of the benefits from routine multi-component fortification. Just finally, uh, you won't be able to see this, but this is the trial design for a proposed trial where we are randomizing very preterm babies to one of three arms. They get maternal milk, but if there's an insufficient supply of maternal milk, they get randomized to either receiving donor milk without fortification, donor milk with fortification or preterm formula. And the outcomes, the primary outcomes here assessed at discharge in the first instance will be necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, and then a, a plan for long-term um, neurodevelopmental follow-up at two years and five years. And the, the trial will be powered for five-year neurodevelopmental outcomes. So this is one proposed collaborative trial that I would like to leave you to consider. And I'd like to end by thanking my research team, um, some of whom you see here, and all of our funders, but most of all, the babies and their parents and our collaborators for um, participating in the research that we do. So thank you very much indeed for listening to us. Very good afternoon to you all. <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. Abhina Modi has very eloquently and very uh, you know, succinctly put across the feeding practices uh, that, they, that are followed for preterm babies. Over and above that, uh, yesterday we had a big session on uh, you know, nutrition of the, and feeding of the VLBW and the ELBW babies. So uh, the topic that has been allotted to me is challenges in implementing the NW feeding guidelines which Dr. Amina uh, uh, Modi has just talked about in, for preterm babies in the Indian setting. So what I'm going to do is, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion on this nutritional aspect, so I, I run the risk of being rather repetitive. So what I'm going to do is give you a little bit, you know, a couple of slides on, you know, why, what are the sort of bottlenecks as far as um, uh, the enteral feeding guidelines are concerned. Then high, uh, listing out the, what the guidelines are, you know, what, what issues that you want to uh, follow. And then I'm going to throw each topic one, one by one open to the audience. And in the audience, because we have a very elite audience here, so what I'd like is that for each issue, 
whether we, you know, what have been your experiences? Have you done any uh, research in it? Because, uh, and then we'll uh, sort of, you know, find uh, find a consensus. So my my talk and the uh, your, our discussions, would, uh, I hope, go together. Um, together. So basically, the challenges faced in implementing the guidelines. I think the first and foremost thing that in our country is that we do not have really uh, well planned, multi-centric, randomized control trials for not only for, for in terms of feeding, but in terms of neonatal care. I mean, they're very. I, I really cannot uh, think of very many uh, trials. Now we are in the process of like, for example, our AIMS wants to do the, uh, uh, the surfactant trial on goat surfactant where they have, you know, uh, sort of um, involved other uh, units across the country. But otherwise, well uh, done, multicentric, randomized research should help us change our practices are really not available. Uh, we are fortunate that yes, over the past five years we have evidence-based clinical practice guidelines which have been brought out by the NNF and many of us in this audience today would have in a way participated in you know, bringing out these uh, guidelines. But again, when we talk of these guidelines, these guidelines are based again on Western uh, uh, research data. Now these guidelines have already become five years old and lots of you know, uh, changes have occurred even in our own country as far as uh, the uh, uh, you know, uh, improvement in care is concerned. So our guidelines do require frequent updating and it would really be ideal if at one stage, maybe not immediately, maybe five years down the line, ten years down the line, then when we update our guidelines, it's really based on Indian data, but I don't think we're in a position to do that right now. Uh, another very important you know, issue is that we do not have, again, a robust uh, you know, uh, databases in terms of either a national database or a regional database. And you know the, the best and the robust database that occurred was uh, the National Neonatal, Neonatal Perinatal Database, in, uh, which was last brought out in 2000. And even till today, in 2015, whenever we want to quote data, whenever we want to quote incidents, incidences, actually, what the, the data that we uh, go back to is the NNPD database. So really, it is time again for us to you know wake up and say, okay, somehow or the other, we have to work together in collaboration and get this uh, data. Then again, as I said, you know, we are busy clinicians and we, we, we call ourselves busy clinicians. And in a way, we're not wrong. I think our whole primary focus is, is uh, clinical. And as far as neonatal departments are concerned, and, uh, you know, incidentally, the department size is proportionate to the size of the newborn. So, uh, you know, wherever there are separate departments of neonatology, like it's one professor, one associate professor, and at the most one uh, lecturer, and then you're looking after that whole gamut of clinical work, the teaching work, your administrative work. So somehow the other research tends to take a back seat and add it to that what happens is that we don't have a wonderful research milieu. And even if you want to do research, yes, you can ultimately get funding, but it's, it's a very tedious process, you know, with uh, fraught with a lot of red tapism. And then if you want to do something which has a means of laboratory backup, then supportive research laboratories is far and few in between. So then what is the answer to this is the clinical research questions that we, I mean, is basically we still have to go back to clinical research and the questions which could really be answered by the bedside. And even to you know, formulate a good research question, we have to be, have some formal training in research methodology. And I think at least as our seniors in the unit, we really haven't had very formal training, but hopefully, you know, I mean, today now MC has made it a mandate that everyone has to have undergone research methodology workshops, and therefore, uh, in the next, hopefully in the next 10 years, we would, uh, we hope to see a better uh, this thing. So coming back to the topic is identify challenges in dental feeding, and what, uh, you know, I'm going to get you all to talk about is, which milk of mother's milk is not available for dental? I mean, you can't really uh, change the topics. There's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of repetition. So, which milk of mother's milk is not available? And in particular, I'd like to focus on uh, the role of human milk banking. Incidentally, uh, our institution is the one which has uh, set the first human milk bank in Asia, and it's 25 years old now, and it's withstood the test of time. So, a uh, little bit on that. Then again, trophic feeding for preterm growth restricted babies because we have such a large growth restricted population. Then of course the burning debate role of probiotics, prebiotics. Then role of others, other you know, amino acids, arginine, glutamine, all of these in prevention of necrotizing enterocolitis. Multi-component fortification which uh, Dr. Nina has touched on at length. So, uh, but like I said, I want the audience to uh, talk about it. How then, uh, again, certain practical issues. How to transition from garbage feeds to oral feeds to uh, breast feeds for PLBW and ELBW babies. And uh, we all do it, and we all do it in our own ways. And 
we succeed, it's not that we don't, but can we have something like some standards as far as this is concerned? Then again, the role of supportive, uh, you know, uh, interventions like oromotor stimulation, non-nutritive sucking, kangaroo mother care, and we have Professor Shashivani, who is, you know, the, uh, she's a pioneer of kangaroo mother care in, uh, in India, so I'm sure Madam would have, would have uh, some, uh, you know, comments to add on to that. And then a little bit on, uh, you know, the, uh, iron, cash, um, uh, calcium, vitamin D, when to start, how long to start. These are actually, I mean, we're doing it day in and day out. Do we have really evidence-based guidelines for our own, uh, 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 you know, country is, what is the issue? So let's start with the first one. That is pasteurized donor milk versus uh, formula. So as um, uh, Dr. Nina has already said that, you know, the, uh, the Cochrane review suggests that, yes, the growth is, uh, you know, when you use formula, the growth is very good, at least in hospital growth. So after, uh, you know, discharge, the growth is not much differences by the time, you know, uh, the end of infancy. And in terms of neurodevelopmental outcome, there's no major uh, difference. But of course, you know, the factor, as we know, of major concern for this is the increased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. And therefore, uh, you know, I would like you all to, you know, come out with your experiences in terms of what is the, when mother's milk is not available, what is the uh, role of uh, banned human milk? Like I said, we've had the first uh, human milk has been, bank has been running for the past 25 years. If you ask me, have you compared uh, formula with uh, donor uh, milk? The, uh, the answer is no, because uh, the, the institution in which I work is situated in the slums of the, you know, the, of Dharavi, which is the largest slum in Asia. So we do not like to use formula. I mean, what we use, the whole focus is on using mother's milk and supplementing mother's milk, milk with bank milk. So I throw this uh, question open to the audience. Would any of you like to? Yes, please, Nami. Yeah, of course, Nina has brought out many, many issues in this uh, this thing. But, I'm going uh, to uh, the broadest question. I have the courage to even answer by this question to you because I know your passion for uh, human milk banking. My concern Passion for supporting breastfeeding. Yeah. I think the human milk banking is an ancillary support to breastfeeding. That's right. uh, my concern has been that uh, what Dr. Nina presented that when you collect, store, process, and then use human milk, how much uh, superior is this process to when you're doing this to collecting cow's milk, processing, storing, and dispensing? Given the quality standards that can break and breach everywhere, we have been always worried about how much is the risk of harming, not just in terms of infection, <coughs> in terms of nutrient disruption. And not that we think formula milk is any day better. So for that reason, since we thought donor milk is not an option to us at all, we don't want to ask without going through the process. And we felt that there is a risk of doing this if you do banking. We had no choice. So we are just now in the process of doing a randomized control trial. In fact, getting guides to say that they want to be part of the research itself was difficult. People didn't want to be called a black sheep. And he, he's the gentleman who is doing the research and he smiling for the first time in the last one and a half years after we heard <laughs> Dr. Nina talking about it. So we just said that we go on pushing for mother's own milk. Yes, but if you reach a point of time when you can't, then you uh, randomize them into saying, that they continue with either the mother's milk, whatever is there, plus a formula. And on the other end, we say we can't give your own mother's milk alone. And we would continue with the parental nutrition, what would continue to replace the volume to volume. And uh, what I must tell you is the trial is going on perfectly well. But there are days when we get suffocated. And it's fourth, fifth day that we are not able to push the mother's milk anymore. And we uh, really want to cross over and say we give formula because continuing parental nutrition is just as dangerous. So I don't know. I'd like no, to... I agree with you. Uh, I'd like to respond to this uh, statement that you've uh, made, Navi. So in terms of uh, one is the immunological components of mother's milk. Yes, pasteurization does destroy all the cells in mother's milk. Actually, even the process of freezing and pasteurization both uh, destroy the cells in mother's milk. Pasteurization uh, um, does decrease the secretory IgA, but that it does retain some amount of the secretory IgA also. The second thing is in terms of lactoferrin, lysozyme, if you look at it, this is all against evidence uh, that is available in literature. Unfortunately, like I said, in India, we, we just don't get around to generating this kind of um, evidence. In the beginning, we did do, and, but at that time, we were pasteurizing at 57 degrees, and that time, we showed that the secretory IgA is maintained at 80% uh, of um, uh, what it was in the uh, raw milk. Uh, lactoferrin and lysozyme also are not totally destroyed. Yes, they are reduced, they are not totally destroyed. Again, the fat soluble vitamins are also not totally destroyed. So, in a, in a setting where the risk 
of uh, you know early feeding is associated with infection, uh, late onset, I mean uh, um, sepsis as well as NEC. I would still uh, you know put forth this uh, uh, this uh, issue that uh, should uh, should mothers uh, banned milk still be the next alternative. Uh, one more thing in terms of the nutrition, uh, there has been uh, work done on nutrition, uh, of course uh, you know the world over as well as in our own institution uh, uh, when Dr. Fernandez was our uh, this thing, her, one of our MS, uh, a couple of our MSc and PhD students have uh, done work on the, uh, you know, the, the major principles of protein, carbohydrate and uh, fat and in terms of the protein and the, uh, the carbohydrate uh, freezing and pasteurization have not made a difference, but in terms uh, of the fat, uh, the, there's some amount of subordification, I mean three fatty acid levels are increased, so the total uh, fat levels are not decreased, but there is a sort of a more free fatty acid, so some amount of fat hydrolysis has been uh, so shown to occur. Just uh, repeating the first question that in Africa when they did studies on expressing human milk yeah. and uh, using formula and look at the e-sakashati counts after four hours, they were just the same in both. And it didn't appear that human milk was more resistant to getting infected when you collect, store, and then process. So I do not know whether when you collect, store, and process human milk for banking, is it really innately more safer than doing that? Uh, uh, Especially uh, if it is not done at probably what we call factory standards. Yeah. So uh, you know, we would. Uh, uh, I mean, all our containers are pasteurized. All our containers are tested for uh, organisms. So we would only use the container if it is, uh, you know, totally free of uh, organisms. So from that point of view, uh, I think, uh, you know, that's what I would say. Um, and like that, that's the whole idea. I mean, I want the audience to say that would they like to look at, uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, just let me just complete my sentence, uh, that uh, would they like to look at, uh, you know, they, these are the issues that we need to look at in our own uh, So maybe, yeah, Dr. Kumada. Um. I can't claim that I have very great experience with milk, a human milk bank, but we have just started it. I really understand the questions of concern expressed by Dr. Navi. But as for us, uh, contamination, as uh, Dr. Jayshi said, if we do a stringent measures and adopt the standard operating guidelines in your collection and storage, we also do not see. Earlier we had some problems with uh, the initial thing, but when we perfected our things, we don't have any culture of contamination. And once if it is contaminated, we don't make a story. If your culture is positive post pasteurization, you discard. Yeah, you discard. And also now we are planning uh, to do, we were only doing post pasteurization culture, but we are also some of the centers. Pre pasteurization. So, so pre pasteurization culture also we are planning. And again, as for the nutritional content, we have not done anything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so before dismissing that, it may not be as good as a breach of formula. I think more centers should work on it and then do research and come out with answers and say, okay, whether it's going to help or not going to help. So that's what. So uh, in planning this uh, research, perhaps Dr. Nina will be, you know, <laughs> yes, they yes, do, yes. Uh, we have a lot of demos yeah. now. We yeah. could uh, do it. And also, again, as for the Dr. Nina's question, which I wanted to say, whether it in enhances her successful breastfeeding or uh, alienates her from the baby. But we find it is a dual response. Yes, we absolutely. do see some of the mothers, okay, uh, there is some alternative, it could be cool. But we need a lot of counseling with those mothers. Uh, of course, milk banking collection is not an easy job. Though I thought it's going to be just collection, it needs a lot of uh, support staff who have to be on the toes round the clock for us to do a good job. Yes, so you I, need dedicated. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So it, it is feasible to start. Uh, we thought it is a far fetched experiment, but after having visited uh, Hyderabad Fernandez Hospital, we had the courage to start it, and having started, I find that. It is not it impossible is, and it could be done. The, our bed, my unit is an extramural unit where we are only outbound and I don't go around asking for other mothers. Those mothers who come for follow-up also are donating and also have funding donation from an outside mother because when you put it in the paper, they do. Yeah. 
and uh, we are able to help her. So they she has sorry, 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 I'm very sorry. Yeah. yeah, so we need to now collaborate, do research and come out with it. Yeah, our system of milk banking is a little different from that in the West. In the West, it's a mother who donates longitude and she wants to, I mean, has chosen to donate and she will continue to express, collect at home and periodically give, uh, give it in the bank. In our uh, hospitals in India, I think across, uh, there are now, believe me, 16 plus milk banks in India. So slowly it is, this issue is taking up and uh, the population is cross-sectional. So these mothers are all tested during uh, their uh, you know, pregnancy, their, their tests are all negative, we're checking them that they're physically healthy, they're not on any medications. And then these mothers in the PNC wards, mothers who follow up in the uh, postnatal well baby clinic, these are the mothers who are actually uh, uh, would donate milk so in that way. So I'm leaving you with this thought that uh, you know at least for the early feeding of a preterm baby till the mother's own milk is available in some, some you know she's able to express in something like uh, like uh, Naveen said that you know you tend, tend to get frustrated when you know, how much do I push the mother to express milk. So till that time that she's able to bring out much uh, more milk would uh, human milk banking be an alternative. So I'm leaving you with that thought. We move on to the next one and that is uh, trophic feeding for uh, um, um, you know, the very preterm baby is less than 32 weeks, but uh, the focus being on uh, preterm age. Can we take the, uh, you know, the uh, discussion time in this itself? Is that okay? Uh, it looks like uh, if you have a lot of time, I mean, the people you track that will have something to... I mean, uh, the, uh, that's what I wanted to, you know, because everything otherwise is very similar to what has already been said. So just uh, as far as in, uh, growth retarded babies is concerned, what would you, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you look at uh, trophic feeding for less than uh, uh, 32 weekers, what the Cochrane review has to say is that there's no neither benefit of, uh, neither evidence of benefit nor evidence of harm in terms of uh, early trophic feeding for VLBW, so feed tolerance, NEC or growth. And, but the ADEPT trial on the other hand has, uh, you know, given us a boost to our you know, already existing thought process and they found that early feeding that is within 48 hours even in growth retarded babies where they have absent or reversed um, uh, diastolic flow velocities uh, in the umbilical artery they found that uh, the time to full enteral feeds was significantly lower in the early feeding group as, as compared to the uh, late feeding group there was no difference in the incidence of uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Plus there were other benefits, there was a shorter duration of parenteral nutrition, high dependency care, um, uh, cholestatic jaundice, so a lot of benefits. Now let's see about what uh, the Indian data has as far as uh, I mean the, the PGI group, they have looked at uh, preterm SGA as well as preterm HA babies, a small study and uh, they have looked at uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, both the groups they had normal umbilical artery uh, flows but they said that uh, you know, they found that th there was a trend towards uh, higher feed intolerance, higher NAC. So obviously the last word is still not being said even in this uh, you know concept of trophic feedings and therefore the researchable issue again is how early should enteral feeding be started in uh, uh, babies who particularly have abnormal uh, Doppler studies. Another issue is when you look at uh, you know uh, this what do you call it uh, minimal enteral nutrition the definition as far as the uh, Cochrane reviews is concerned is they say they start with whatever 12 or 24 ml per kg per uh, day and they keep it static for almost 5 to 7 days. So and from our own clinical experience we know that you don't have to keep it static if the baby is doing well you can you know scale up gradually. So again that also becomes a researchable issue can we generate this kind of evidence. So uh, do any of you have experience on this or would you like to uh, uh, at the end? Okay. So then again comes probiotics for, for prevention of NEC. Uh, Nina has already talked about it in detail. But again, the researchable, uh, I mean, there is definitely for VLVW evidence for uh, in its favor. But again, in our own uh, you know context, what we need to see is, uh, you know, as far as Indian babies are concerned, do we, because our focus is already on human milk. So do we really need, do our babies really need to be given uh, probiotics, excepting in perhaps the ELBW group. So do the VLBWs, do all VLBWs really need to be probiotics? Uh, is anyone practicing for probiotics for VLBW babies? So, I mean, even though the Cochrane Review says, and even though the Australian group, Sanjay Patoli and all, you know, their meta analysis also said that, you know, I, I, what stops us from changing? Yes, there is something that still uh, stops us from changing our uh, um, attitudes to uh, this thing. And this is again a researchable issue for. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> multi component fortification again um, uh, Dr. Nina has talked about. Uh, I think one of the issues uh, you know some where some research has been done in our country and that is on uh, the, uh, uh, the osmolality issues and uh, the PGI group have looked at the osmolality of human milk. They've, uh, 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 they've said it's about 302 many osmoles per liter. 
uh, and uh, when you add HMF, it is actually 392. And if you use low birth weight formula, it's around 390 when you are small. So, uh, you know, that raises issues in terms of, uh, you know, again, increasing the likelihood of NEC. So, again, I think this becomes, a, uh, you know, for our own country, we have to again generate our own data. Then, uh, effects of breastfeeding versus formula feeding on body composition. And here, again, uh, I quote an uh, article that Nina was one of the. Um, uh, authors and they have said that as far as uh, formula fed babies are concerned, they actually in the uh, in early inf in infancy, or in the first year of life, they uh, the, their fat free um, uh, the fat free mass is higher than their fat mass. But after the first year, it converts into a higher fat uh, fat mass, and this tends to continue. And therefore, this again has a bearing on um, is this uh, you know the use of this formula actually going to result in more overweight and more obesity um, later on in life again, um, uh, a researchable issue for us. Then uh, other issues like vitamin D, we know that vitamin D not only is important for, you know, for the bones but also for uh, the neurological outcomes. And then what is the standard recommendations for the dose of vitamin D? If you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, they're looking at for less than 1500 grams, 200 to 400 international units per day. For more than 1500 grams, they're looking at four, uh, 400 international units per day to be stepped up to, as ma to a maximum of uh, 1000 international units per day depending upon, uh, uh, you know, if uh, on the serum alkaline phosphatase levels. And if you look at the uh, European guidance, the SPN uh, recommendations, they straight away recommend 800 to 1000 units per day. And if you look at some research that is done in our country, again, it's uh, the, the Chandigarh group, uh, uh, no, sorry, it's uh, the, uh, the AIMS group, they have given 800 uh, international <coughs> units of vitamin D to all uh, BLBW babies, and they've looked at their vitamin D levels at uh, term and at three months uh, corrected gestation age, and they found that the vitamin D deficiency was definitely uh, lower, but they found that there was no improvement in the bone mineralization, and they actually occasionally found babies who had hypervitaminosis D. So again, for our own country, given our own, uh, you know, the population, we need to look at what is the optimal dose. Again, what is the optimal dose of calcium, phosphorus, and for how long do we give this calcium? Once the weaning has been, uh, you know, once you initiate weaning, once you end, uh, weaning has been completed, what would be the right time for, uh, for uh, how long these um, have to be given? And lastly, of course, iron supplementation, again, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, debate upon early iron supplementation versus late iron supplementation. The earlier, the, the current, uh, you know, one of the latest uh, meta-analysis, again, it's a small group of about 250 babies uh, in the Italian Journal of Pediatrics. They have said that, uh, I, I, they have highlighted the importance of iron only, not only for prevention of anemia, but the role of iron in, in uh, you know, growth, in uh, memory, in behavior, in neurodevelopmental outcomes. And they've, said, uh, and they've s shown that if you use iron early, that is, uh, early is by 15 to 17 days if you've used early iron, that there's a significantly smaller decrease in the serum ferritin and hemoglobin levels. The rates of blood transfusions required by these VLB and ELBW babies is lesser, and there is no difference in the incidence of NEC. But the word of caution is that iron, when you've given lots of transfusions to preterm babies, especially the ELBWs as they want to get, in that kind of a situation, there could be an iron overload, and iron, as we know, is, uh, you know, can cause oxidant injury. Now, Indian data is, uh, again, uh, Kanya Mukhopadhyay has uh, looked at iron stores in uh, preterm AGA, preterm SGA and term babies, and they found that the preterm SGA had the lowest iron stores as compared to the, uh, the preterm AGA and the term baby. So again, uh, is, uh, and that, whereas on the other hand, the uh, AIMS group have uh, looked at the use of early and iron at uh, two weeks as compared to, uh, uh, you know, the standard at six to eight weeks. And they have found that it did not make any uh, difference to the serum paratin or the hematological parameters. So again, the last word is not being said as far as iron supplementation is also concerned. So again, there is scope for us to evaluate. And lastly, uh, you know, we've heard of uh, uh, Clapsy bundles and all, you know, uh, bundles for other things. Now there is a feeding bundle that has been uh, you know, put together. Actually, it's, it's just small evidence-based things, things that we're doing daily, but things which have been actually, uh, you know, looked at as to how the group of activities put together reduces postnatal growth retardation. And they found, uh, it's reported in the Journal of Perinatology in 2015, and they've reported a significant reduction in the extra uterine fetal growth restriction. So these are just some of the issues that I thought we would, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'd like everyone to look at. And thank you for giving me a question. Can we see the last slide? Sorry? The last slide. Yeah.
Yes. Uh, so, my in uh, ventilated babies for more than two weeks, the role of IV phosphorus, intravenous phosphorus, is there? So we, we use, um, well, we use, um, uh, we give phosphorus in parental nutrition, um, at least a minimal per kilo per day, um, <clears throat> but also actually, so uh, we have sodium acid phosphate oral preparation. Um, I, someone was telling me that you, have, you don't have this here, uh, but that's what, that's what we, we would use for a baby who's on oral feeds, um, one millimole of sodium acid phosphate PD. And we'd start phosphate, oral phosphate supplements, so long as, when the baby is getting at least um, a, a milk volume of 10 mils. So quite early on. Thank you, Mary. One more thing. Uh, evidence for the uh, late preterms regarding calcium and phosphorus supplementation, 32 to 36 speakers. I think all preterms, uh, I'm not able to quote from evidence directly, but all preterms would be supplemented based on the uh, uh, the principle that uh, it's not only calcium phosphates, it's also vitamin D. Vitamin D. Remember, you know, we always, uh, the whole focus seems to be for the uh, uh, residences, calcium and phosphates, but what is very important for it to get accredited into the bones is vitamin D. Okay, one more thing. Thank you. Is there any role of uh, reticulocyte percentage when, when, when superior to ferritin in uh, uh, identifying high deficiency states? Reticulocyte percentage is there. Uh, is it so it's more superior to serum ferritin? And uh, I think when you have the reticulocyte response, you know that it is uh, that your, your your bone marrow is responding. So uh, and if it's uh, not there, then it is uh, you know. But I don't know whether the, of the two whether there is uh, any superiority of reticulocyte response. I'm not aware. Would you like to? I, I would just agree with you that if you've got a retic response, then it suggests that actually the baby is is is, is starting to produce their own red, red cells. So it's a it's a good thing to see. But in terms of guiding you, no, I I don't think it's going to be sensitive enough. Actually, when uh, we wanted to do a study earlier on looking at early and uh, late ion therapy, two weeks and six weeks, and we started measuring the ferritin levels, knowing well that's not the best way to find out what is the iron level, it's an acute phase response and it is not the, the iron which the brain needs. But still what we found as a surprise was, in spite of consistent therapy, there was a ferritin level was sprayed all over the place in both the uh, uh, studies and those babies who had received even one back cell transfusion had ferritin levels shooting to 900. So we learned two things is that there was no difference in the hemoglobin, MCV, retic in two to six weeks. Understanding what people have already known that probably iron indices are not, the RBC takes them all away and we don't know what's happening to the brain iron. And second one was that if you want to measure iron therapy, we better look at some iron indices rather than look at RBCs and reticulocytes if you want to measure iron. So either we say we have a better measure than ferritin or short of that at least ferritin. And if the ferritin levels are low, then probably need to ask yourself and that low number has been defined by many people as 20, 35, 70 and what not. So there are people who have said 75 and in our study both on the early and the late not even 20 percent babies reached 70 levels. So I think we will be under treating them, they don't know. I mean the, the iron story is extremely interesting and getting more and more complicated with each year that goes by and um, I would re recommend that you read the Hepcidin le literature because that suggests really that the extent to which enteral absorption of iron is, is, is related to um, iron stores adds to the complexity of all of this. And so I think that simply by measuring these various markers, um, as you rightly said, they're incredibly variable, they're very poorly predictive, um, they've not been correlated with, with accurately with long-term outcomes. And then you add this increased complexity, and quite frankly, one says, well, we're not going to go there. It's too, it's too, it's, it, it, it's too difficult. But I, I, think, I think I agree with you that measuring these indices is certainly not the way forward. Okay, last three questions like this. Uh, so
most of our mothers are educated and motivated only once the baby is born about breastfeeding. This is a very important issue. Second thing, when once the you know, preterm baby is born, we may say that we excess cholesterol and the smearing the cholesterol into the oral cavity definitely will make the change. The reason is, once we say that, this will give you the nutrition and also the epithelialization of the gastrointestinal tract that will stimulate the mother. I think the antenatally, actually the mother has to be motivated and you know, before we talk about our banking and all, I think the basic foundation we need to see that that should be strong. Agreed. It has to be multi-prong. I mean, yeah. it's not that the banking is the yeah. one and only. It has to be a multi-prong. Multi I mean, uh, like you said, the oral installation of yeah. uh, at least the 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 one drop is there. Is beneficial for because it enhances the colonization, yeah. with, you know, with the good bacteria, and uh, yeah. therefore actually increase, reduces the uh, supposed to reduce the incidence of yeah. ventilator-associated pneumonia also. Yeah, there is so there are, uh, you know, interesting benefits. So, yeah. I agree. Um, this is, uh, good morning, this is regarding an issue which I find that most doctors open, rarely openly admit and even if they do, it's hush hush. Uh, we know that fresh maternal milk is far superior to donor uh, breast milk. What is the experience with using um, a milk from another mother? What are the problems faced? And are the problems mainly from the doctor's side? Are the parents having problems with this? Your only concern is that you don't know whether the mother, uh, I mean, for, for using unpasteurized milk, is whether the theoretical concern of uh, mother being in the window period for some infection. So when you're pasteurizing all the milk, you are taking care of that. I think that is the major difference. You don't seem to be happy with the answer. <laughs> what, is it that, what is it that you would like to, I mean, what is your contention on that? When you can use the mother's milk for her own child, even if it's in the window period, and this is a concern, and this is a concern, but the incidence is so is not so high. The benefits are far better. No, yeah, um, I know. Is anybody doing it? With the consent, I mean, they can consent, of course. situation for years together we have been using express breast milk from other mothers to feed our babies under certain situations. Of course we do screen the mother from whom we are going to take the milk that is for HIV and their hepatitis. Uh, we do not have the facilities for other uh, screening method but we have been using it and we have been saving a lot of babies but under very, very compromised situations where we do not have better alternatives. And the only thing I can say is, we have been having a regular follow-up OPD, covering almost about 70 to 80 percent follow-up, and we have not seen any adverse effects. And at least in the situation where we are working, majority of the mothers are very happy to donate their milk for the babies. And we have even tried to give preterm mother's milk for preterm babies. But beyond that, I am not able to say. And on ethical grounds, people are very shy to talk about these experiences. But I can definitely, and similar is the experience from many other pediatricians of our age who have been working with the poor patients. And another thing here I want to say, this is just our experience we are working with the other communities. Under dire situations, even animal milk also we have to use. 
but uh, of course in this forum I didn't want to mention, yeah. but I wanted to say this, many of our people in the hospitals, we are using express breast milk collected from mothers with all the safety precautions that we have been using. Only thing we now have to get some ethical clearance, how to go about these studies, but they are very relevant to our situation. Okay, uh, uh, just uh, two questions based out of what experience we have gone through, one each to Neema and Jayashree. We have done a study about six years back on an MD thesis where we gave aggressive nutritional strategy with parental nutrition as long as the ankle feeds were established and daily monitored only the weight of the baby twice a day. Neema, the question is for you. When we would go on to full enteral nutrition, when the child has reached full feeds, we would stop the parental nutrition as what would be the recommendation. There was a significant growth dip. Subsequently, it took a long time for the baby again to reach that peak. So, would you still recommend, suppose the long lines are in place, there is probably a low risk situation in the NIC of what risk. If you look at the incidence of uh, catheter related infections, suppose the inst institution doesn't have much risk like that. Would you still recommend removing the parent orientation? Because this was definitely something we noted. Life is about swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Um, but th this is the issue. The, the risk of sepsis, um, in, certainly in the study that we did, the risk of sepsis with, in, with parental nutrition increases, uh, the odds of sepsis increase 15 fold with, in the presence of parental nutrition. That's the risk that you take. Uh, you want a baby who's, who's septic or a baby who's, who's uh, had, had uh, sustained weight gain. It's a, it's a balance. The only other thing I would say is that this, this, this notion of aggressive nutrition um, has yet to be demonstrated yes, to, be, to be effective. Yes. So yes. that's another issue and it may be that the reason that you saw a dip mm -hmm. is because the baby was growing extremely rapidly and then was catching down rather than catching up. So it may not have been, it's impossible to tell, but it may not have been actually a, a, a bad thing that you saw. So our practice is to um, stop parental nutrition when a baby is receiving 120 mils per kilo of milk or 150 mils per kilo of milk because we want to get that long line out and we want to stop that PN quickly. Great. Jeshri, there's a question here. We have only one HMF in the market in India. Unfortunately, we have got it assessed that we find that the calcium levels are very high practically not usable. We have had babies developing nephrocalcinosis with sustained use of this. What would you suggest? Do we do supplementation if at all with separate uh, additional things or do you use this fortified? Uh, uh, I totally agree with you on that um, part. And then, uh, basically, you know, I think it depends on at what stage you are. So the, uh, early in the stage, you know, once you've reached full phase and you want to start your fortification, probably multi-component fortification is important. In fact, that's what I put up as the researchable issues. I think I was a little hassled for time. But one of the researchable issues, again, is this, that how long do we uh, use the multi-component fortification? Then when do we use, uh, move on to supplementation as independent supplementation? So again, we need to take a call on that because, yes, the, you know, the total calcium, the protein content is very minuscule. I mean, we have only one, that too, it's a powder fortifier. Uh, and I think one of the researchable issues is to work with the pharma companies for better, uh, you know, uh, with a better protein content or targeted, you know, for protein or for energy or whatever kind of, uh, uh, you know, your uh, uh, fortifiers. And at what stage do we need to, uh, this thing is again a researchable issue. So generally, uh, I, I, you know, as I look at it, most babies in my practice tend to wean off the, uh, you know, how long do you give the multi-component fortification? They wean off the, the multi-component by themselves. Because once they take, they're onto breastfeeding, even if you tell the mothers to fortify, most of the mothers, uh, you know, will sort of just, you know, sort of crush it apart. Because their the babies are feeding well to their eyes, the babies are growing well. So what is the indication? So uh, I think we, uh, there is need for research as to, at what weight we should uh, stop the fortification. So we, One last aside, this is just for babies whose mothers have brought the EBM from home. We have had a problem. I would think that most of the units in the UK would have breast milk expressed in the unit. Yes. You correct me if I'm wrong. And then they go home. Do you have a situation where breast milk is brought from home? That is what. 
We have had situations where that is universally witnesses, done in, uh, uh, in uh, most of the Western countries. Now we have had situations where, though we take a concern that this is the mother's breast milk, many times we find, as Archana has also pointed out, certain wet nurses at home are contributing to that. We are not sure whether it's mother's real breast milk which is coming. Once even a patient brought goat's milk and said that is mother's breast milk. <laughs> Are you talking so, about her own baby? Means when the yes. mothers are See, mothers the are at are home. home. Mothers are an outbound unit. Mothers are at home. So mothers send their breast milk, saying it's their breast milk, but it may be somebody else's milk. Somebody at home. So I don't know so how to tackle it. Like, there are several uh, questions. I'll just ask one thing because uh, I mean, Archana is not there. So the whole debate was talking about the evidence. So that's the purpose we're all here now. So our first breast milk aside, like we have people like Naveen and many people trying to get best, uh, doing the best to get the breast milk. Gold standard, let's not even debate about it. We have to improve on that. Let's have bundles that, that they should have shown like that. Next, coming to next decision about formula milk or the donor's breast milk or other's milk like that. The clear discussion now we're trying to have is, is there any uh, evidence that formula milk is worse than the donor milk or donor milk is better than formula milk? That is what we are debating here because let's not be emotional about it. Is it legal or emotional issue? That is clearly what we are trying to debate here. Currently, as Nina has shown now, that like, you know, donor milk is not superior to the former milk, at least as, as such the evidence is there. Sorry, I mean there is no evidence either way. Exactly, we don't know, I think it's fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. But then in that case, are we wrong in starting the former milk? Uh, um, that, that, that's the debate like, you know, that we need to have. Praveen, uh, some of us were there in the great meeting one year back and we realized that enough is enough and it's not RCT is the answer everything. Yeah. Just like Dr. Nina was showing that collecting what we are practicing and what is the outcome also is one way of going about it. And there are not uh, more numbers anywhere in the world than we have in India. Yeah. So I think even if eight, this is, this is such a topic for if eight, nine, simply just willing to share what they're doing, nothing more. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing and one outcome, yeah. whatever you want. I think we'll have answers. We try to do that under the banner of IAP in Ontology Fellowship. 53 centers are having fellowship programs in the country just now. But the problem is only four centers decide to share the data for various reasons. So, unless we get down to at least say what we're doing and ask what is happening, I don't think we need randomized trials of any size. If you're having 1,000 babies coming from every center for five years, you will have more numbers than anyone else in the world. Yeah. I think the whole issue is because neonatologists, a neonatologist, all over are looked upon as anti-IMS act. You know, we feel that okay, if I accept that I am giving formula, you, you are against the IMS act, and that's why I think most of us are reluctant to share the data. I completely agree. We are all, let's be honest. I do use formula in my unit, but again, because I have a situation where the mothers don't come with the babies, only the babies do come. And I think there's nothing wrong in looking at our own experience. If, if you ask me, I have not collected prospect, but that's what I think the thought came to my mind. Let me look at my own data and see how many of the babies who received a mixed kind of, it's never been a pure formula, but it's always been a mixed kind of feeding. But the baby did receive some formula, ended up getting mother's milk, and most of them did go home on mother's milk. But there were situations where babies, most of, most of my babies would have received a couple of days of formula. So I just want to look back and I think I would be happy to Prospect look at the data and say how many babies did end up with any semen. That's what been the major phobia with us. Okay, did I do a major harm by doing that two days, three days of formula when mothers were not around? I think, I mean, my experience right now is I didn't have a very great incidence of any And uh, coming to Dr. Archana's apprehension also, I had a couple of mothers who had a surrogate, who had delivered by surrogacy, who were requesting me, is it possible for you to get the mother's milk from the existing mothers in the NIC? And my answer was, yeah, I have no problem. I could always facilitate you and allow you to discuss with that mother and if she's okay and you are okay, I have no problem. The other way, I, at the time, many times I get over the situation, I ask them, if you have any wet mothers or nursing mothers in your family, if you can allow them to give their milk, we have no issues with that. So I honestly tell them, it's okay you get the mother's milk. It's much better than giving formula. Even if she's a term mother, I have no problem in using that mother's milk rather than to use formula. Many times I request them to speak with other mothers. Like there are mothers who, Lactating very well, I tell this mother if you request and talk to them because I don't want to. I just tell them you request and if both of you agree, I said I have no problem. I'm not, and, and most of the mothers who are in my unit, they're all screened for their so called HIV, HBCG. So I definitely don't have that apprehension. My only thing is here, mothers are very emotional about it. And I had one situation in Chandigarh where the nurses would rampantly do this without our knowledge, and one of the mothers 
did see uh, others mothers milk being used and unfortunately this baby became septic two days later and she went all the board saying that my baby got sick because you used somebody others mother's milk and that's where we had to really pass you because she she had seen that the nurses doing it they were doing just out of good will because it was just happened one mother has got so much of milk she would just use it instead of uh, giving formula and that was an accepted norm but this particular incident really made you know she made a big huge and cry that you used it without my permission first and my baby became sick because you used that mother's milk and that's where situation you don't want to get into but it's a good idea to just encourage and then there's absolutely nothing wrong in talk, uh, allowing her to talk to the other mother or any other nursing mother that's what you want to sharing of experience yeah, we, have, we have we have a lot of this we have a lot of this very honestly and no issues but as long as both the mothers have agreed thank you very nice to hear that uh, we're coming to looking at our data and then sharing like as knowing saying that's one aim and also uh, uh, you know some trials that uh, uh, we mentioned and Ravi is going to look at that whether we can collaborate and do that trials uh, uh, on the well and and uh, many issues that uh, uh, dr jashi brought about I like, you know what we could look at, like it, 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 it will be for the next five years, you can do many studies there. A uh, lot of ideas that you've given and uh, whoever is there want to collaborate with, like you know you can communicate and collaborate. Thank you very much.